In an earlier video, we alluded to the fact that carbohydrates contain both electrophilic and nucleophilic groups within their structures, and the way these are arranged within the open chain monosaccharides, like the D-glucose structure you see here, opens the door to cyclization reactions. Recall that the hydroxyl oxygen is nucleophilic and the carbonyl carbon is electrophilic. The addition of the hydroxyl oxygen to the carbonyl carbon gives rise to a cyclic structure in which there's a new CO bond, and it looks like a hydrogen has migrated from the hydroxyl oxygen to the former carbonyl oxygen, which now becomes part of a hydroxyl group. This is an addition process in the forward direction, and in the reverse direction, which corresponds to ring opening, this is an elimination process. In fact, if we pay close attention to the functional group that we've created here, we'll notice that it looks rather familiar. This is a tetrahedral carbon connected to two oxygens via single bonds, one of which is part of a hydroxyl group, and the other of which is part of an alkoxy group. This is nothing more than a hemiacetal, and the mechanism of formation of this hemiacetal from the open chain form is really no different than the acid or base catalyzed formation of a hemiacetal that we've seen previously. The general idea is acid or base catalyzed nucleophilic addition of the hydroxyl group across the carbonyl group. The elementary steps involved are first a proton transfer, and then nucleophilic addition, and then a second proton transfer. So let's look quickly at the acid and base catalyzed versions of this reaction. In the acid catalyzed mechanism, the carbonyl oxygen is protonated first. Then the hydroxyl group adds in in an ADN step. And finally, the hydroxyl oxygen, which is now positively charged, is deprotonated to give the neutral hemiacetal. Notice that the overall mechanism is nothing more than an acid catalyzed nucleophilic addition step. Proton on, the business occurs, proton off. The base catalyzed mechanism involves the same classes of elementary steps, but the proton transfers happen in reverse order. First, the 5 hydroxyl group is deprotonated to form an alkoxide. This alkoxide adds to the carbonyl carbon, forming the conjugate base of hemiacetal, and the resulting negatively charged oxygen is protonated to form the hemiacetal product and regenerate the hydroxide catalyst. And here again, notice that all we're doing is a base catalyzed nucleophilic addition process. And because it's intramolecular, this is a very rapid process. This reaches equilibrium very quickly when, for example, we dissolve a monosaccharide in water. And as we can see from the equilibrium arrows, this tends to favor the product side significantly. This equilibrium is often greater than 99 to 1 in favor of the cyclic form, and so you often see monosaccharides drawn in this form. The carbon atom that we find at the center of the hemiacetal functional group is also known as the anomeric carbon. And there are a few things worth pointing out about anomeric carbons, as these are among the most important carbons within monosaccharides. Arguably, the anomeric carbon is the most important carbon in a monosaccharide. Notice that in both the open chain form and the closed or cyclic form, the anomeric carbon has an oxidation state of plus 2 because it bears two bonds to oxygen. In the open chain form, this carbon is part of an aldehyde or ketone, and in either case, that carbon is not a stereocenter because it's trigonal planar. However, in the cyclic form, this carbon becomes stereogenic. It's now tetrahedral and connected to four different groups, a carbon, an alkoxy group, a hydroxyl group, and an implied hydrogen. Because that carbon is now stereogenic, there are two possible isomers of the cyclic form that can exist with different configurations at this starred carbon, and those isomers are called anomers. We'll look at anomers in more detail in a future video. For now, the big point is that monosaccharides cyclize spontaneously in solution and tend to heavily favor their cyclic forms. Usually this is something like greater than 99 to less than 1 in favor of the cyclic form. Now, this doesn't mean that the open chain form can be completely ignored. For example, reactions of the carbonyl group can still take place as long as they siphon off the open chain form, because thanks to Le Chatelier's principle, removing some of the open chain form will cause generation of more of the open chain form. However, many reactions of monosaccharides take place through the cyclic form, and in biochemical contexts, for example, in crystal structures of proteins where we find carbohydrates as substrates, you'll almost always, nearly always, see these in their cyclic forms. 
we classify the cyclic forms of sugars based on the size of the ring. One thing you may have noticed from the previous slide is that we chose to use the hydroxyl linked to carbon 5. This creates a six-membered ring, which is called a pyranose, because of its resemblance to pyran, which is a six-membered heterocycle containing oxygen. Cyclic monosaccharides containing five-membered rings are called furanoses because of their resemblance to furan, a five-membered ring heterocycle containing an oxygen atom. And notice that to form the furanose, the glucofuranose, the hydroxyl group linked to carbon-4 was used in the cyclization. Let's number the carbons to make that clear. The hydroxyl linked to carbon-4 was used as the nucleophile to create this glucofuranose, whereas to create the pyranose, the six-membered ring, the hydroxyl group linked to carbon-5 was used. Pyranoses are quite often the favored forms of cyclic monosaccharides because of their tendency to exist as chair-like structures. Notice this strain-free chair-like structure of the pyranose that we see in this three-dimensional model. On the other hand, there are some sugars that can only form furanoses. For example, the pentose, ribose, which only contains five carbons within its backbone, tends to form a five-membered furanose ring. One last thing to note is that we can combine this furanose and pyranose nomenclature with the name of the sugar based on the stereochemical relationships between the hydroxyl-bearing stereocenters. So we can talk about, for example, a glucopyranose, meaning take the open chain form of glucose and cyclize it to form a six-membered ring, or glucofuranose, meaning take that same open chain form and cyclize it to form a five-membered ring. We can also combine this nomenclature with D and L. For example, both of these are examples of D glucoses. And you can verify this by thinking about the Fischer projection of carbon-5 in both of these structures.